So could you please state your full name? Michael John Humphreys. And your age, please? 72. And where were you born? Richmond, Surrey, England. And uh, as a child, what did your parents do? My father was a Royal Air Force regular, trained initially as a wireless uh, technician, got his uh, pilot's uh, wings and uh, was a fighter pilot beginning of Second World War. He, uh, he was shot down over France in May 1940, badly injured, got back to England, spent many months in hospital whilst they rebuilt his leg. And that's where he met my mother, who was a registered nurse. And uh, I guess the rest is history, but uh, he finished up the war. He never flew again. He finished up the war as a uh, station warrant officer in the Shetland Islands. Um, was invalided out in 1946 and uh, joined the civil service, worked his way up through the ranks in the, in the Board of Trade and retired as a senior executive officer in 1976. My mother, uh, after I was born, she quit nursing and uh, she just became a stay-at-home housewife, which I think was fairly standard at that time. Very much. Did, uh, did you have a lot of siblings? A brother and a sister, yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, what were your interests, the things to do for fun in, as a child? Oh, as a child, I suppose uh, we were living in southwest London uh, up until the age of 11. And uh, for fun, we used to play on the uh, bombed out building sites. Uh, war games, bicycle riding, kicking a ball around, playing soccer. When I went to teenage, of course, it was grammar school and then it was uh, lots of homework and <laughs> army cadets. So how about it in school? Were there any uh, subjects where you excelled at or where you had a particular interest? Well, uh, school history, I went to uh, junior primary or primary junior school in, in uh, southwest London near Wimbledon. Uh, took my 11 plus exam and uh, passed that. Uh, at the same time, my parents moved out to Surrey, so I ended up going to uh, Surbiton County Grammar School. I took uh, seven subjects at General Certificate of Education Ordinary Level, basically math, physics, chemistry. I took Latin and, and French, uh, English, and then uh, went into the sixth form. I took math, physics, and chemistry for three years got my advanced levels and uh, won a place at the Royal School of Mines to study metallurgy and uh, also won an industrial scholarship with Richard Thomas Baldwin's, uh, which was a five-year sandwich course, a year in industry first, three years at the university to take an honours degree and then uh, another year to sort of wrap up. Kind of like them. a co-op degree is now. It, it would be considered a bit of a co-op, but in actual fact, we, we actually had uh, the three solid years at university, mm -hmm. uh, and it was just the, the, the one year ahead of time, which was very good, actually, because we, we worked our way all the way through a, an integrated steel plant uh, system. So we went to university that much older, uh, that much, much wiser. wiser. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, were your plans ever to go into mining, or you kind of just fell into it? Uh, I, I fell into uh, metallurgy purely and simply because uh, RTB were offering these scholarships uh, in chemistry, metallurgy, mechanical or electrical engineering, and metallurgy sounded a bit more exotic than being a chemist. And I talked to a neighbour who happened to be a practicing metallurgist, and and that's that's how I ended up being going into metallurgy. Chemistry was always my favorite subject, but. Um, what, were, what was the um, experience you, uh, you gathered working during that degree? During that degree? Uh, well, the first year, as I say, was to, to uh, go through an integrated steel plant. You, you start at the, where the coke came, coke ovens, steel plant, the blast furnaces, steel plant, etc. Then you went through all the hot rolling and cold rolling tin plate, galve line, and so on. And over a year, you worked your way through all these various departments, and uh, you worked on projects. Um, so it was a, a fairly good grounding in the steel industry. And then uh, three years at uh, university, the first uh, summer vacation, worked at the uh, company's uh, research laboratories. Second year, hiked off to Sweden, for, worked there for three months in a steel plant. Um, and then, of course, graduated at the end of third year and went back to the company. And I started as a development officer 
in the R&D group in uh, Landward Newport uh, in 1966, 67. So um, now uh, we're in Canada. When did you actually move to Canada? I came over in 1968. Okay, not uh, that long after. No, uh, the British steel industry was going to be renationalized by the then Labour government, and uh, the R and D group that I was working with was going to be amalgamated with another one from another steel company. So uh, that would have meant moving further west into Wales. So I decided that uh, I'd take a look and see where I could go. Canada was an obvious choice. I'd shared an apartment with two mechanical engineering students at Imperial who'd been hired directly by Ontario Hydro in 1966 on graduation. So I had contacts here. And also when I looked around the world, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, they all had drawbacks of one form or another, not least, of course, the Vietnam War if you were going to go to the United States. So uh, I opted for Canada and it's been a very good, uh, a very good choice. Yeah. How did you find uh, Canada? What was your first impression of uh, Canada my first as a whole? Oh, my first impression was arriving in uh, Toronto airport uh, and being picked up in a 1968 Dodge Charger and whistling down the 401. I <laughs> that was my first major impression of Canada. Uh, I, I stayed with friends in, in Toronto until I got the job here in, in Sudbury with, with INCO. And uh, I put in 30 years, retired in 1998. And what were the big differences professionally uh, between England and Canada? Uh, I don't think there were a great deal of number of differences. Uh, I think engineers here get uh, far more respect than they, they do in, in, in England. Um, it's more the sort of continental flavor, you know, if you're an engineer in Germany, for example, they would address you as, you know, engineer. Um, but here, I found everybody was much more laid back than they were in, in, in Britain. Um, everybody's on a first name basis. And the only other major change I saw was that uh, working in a steel plant uh, in, in Britain, or any heavy industry in Britain, there were cafeterias on site where you can get a subsidized meal. No such thing at INCO. Um, you had to go out for lunch or you bought in a sandwich or whatever. They had lunch rooms, but that was it. Mm -hmm. But working, work-wise? Uh, Fairly similar. Very similar. I had a, a very steep learning curve for the first few months, changing from steel industry to, to nickel industry, but, and it was all new. Uh, so it was, it was exciting, it was exhilarating. So could you go a bit through your, uh, your career at INCO, just uh, kind of briefly, and then maybe we'll stop along the way. Okay, uh, joined INCO in September 68, uh, went to the smelter supposedly for three weeks and three years later I got out of there. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was taken on as a graduate engineer, made it to project leader in a few weeks and I ended up as the section leader nine months later. Um, and uh, from there I, I did a small stint in the pyrometallurgical laboratory uh, and then I moved over to in 1971 to the nickel refinery, which was in the final stages of, of building and construction. I was the, uh, if you like, the process engineer for the converter plant there. Uh, spent uh, until 1976 there. Then I transferred to the mineral dressing test center, a completely different area. Uh, away from pyrometallurgy and into the, the mineral dressing side of the business. Uh, a few years there, back to the lab as the section leader in charge of the pyrometallurgy laboratory. Then I went to mat processing, and then they amalgamated mat processing in the smelter, so I, I came full circle in about 1982. Got involved with uh, the environmental uh, control group within smelter tech services. Uh, then moved into the, the technical side of the, uh, the business, the pyrometallurgy side of it, and uh, ended up as the superintendent of uh, tech services uh, and uh, spent three years as the superintendent and of the smelter complex uh, research group. And then uh, I retired in 1998. The real question, did you uh, officially retire? 
or was there some consulting or other? <laughs> I, I left on pretty good terms, uh, and uh, so uh, I, I got the odd call to could I come in and take a look at this or take a look at that. Some years it was one or two weeks, other years it was months. <laughs> um, and then in 19, uh, no, in 2008, uh, I was asked by Hatch Associates here in Sudbury if I would get involved uh, in uh, looking at flow sheets for uh, the next stage of the sulfur dioxide abatement uh, project uh, for what is now Valet. And uh, I spent uh, five months, six months with them putting together various scenarios and training one of their very smart young engineers and uh, they picked up everything I knew in six months. It took me three years to get there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, it was, uh, that, was, uh, that was very interesting. But I haven't done anything since 2008. Okay. What, uh, what would have been your um, favorite part of your career? Is there a specific job or um, specialization you preferred? Uh, I would say that the, 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 uh, there were two things, two, two, two periods that I, that I really enjoyed. One was starting up the, the converter plant in the nickel refinery and the other was uh, starting up the bulk uh, furnaces and, and so on in the, in the new bulk smelter that was uh, started up in 1993-94. And uh, I mean that's still basically an ongoing project. Could you talk a bit about the uh the beginnings of the Coppercliff uh, nickel refinery? Well, I went over there in 1971, as I say. At that time, the plant was still under construction. Um, there were no offices, so we, we, we had cubicles in the warehouse, <laughs> uh, reviewed the various engineering drawings and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we started to hire the, the staff. Um, they got the uh, control room operators in, and they got the foreman in, and so on. And we actually started to plant up with staff. Um, and uh, it wasn't until we'd sort of ironed out some of the bugs. That I don't know how many bugs there were in the high pressure carbonyl plant, but there's certainly a few uh, major problems uh, starting up in the, in the converter plant, um, which we solved very quickly. We had to. Um, and then we brought in the, the unit guys uh, and trained them and, and so on uh, to take over. Um, the problems we had, uh, for example, the, the feed for that plant, uh, the converter plant produced a crude nickel that was then uh, granulated and shipped over to the carbonyl plant for ex refining. They, they extracted the, the nickel and some of the iron as, a, as carbonyls, and then from that, they, by uh, destroying the carbonyl, by heating it, they would create pure pellets or powders and so on. So. Uh, the first thing was that the, 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 the feed for the top blown rotary converters was supposed to be briquetted. And uh, it didn't work. Uh, it was a blend of metallics uh, from the MAC processing plant, a residue from Thompson, Manitoba, and also a, a sulfur cake from Thompson. And the metallics and the sulfur were supposed to react together and form very hard briquettes. Well, when the test work was done, people had blended these things together, put it in 45-gallon drums, and shipped it down to Comrack Greaves for testing. And they produced perfect pellets, uh, perfect briquettes, no problem at all. When you got the raw material directly from the mat processing plant with about 4% moisture in it, we found we needed about seven passes through the briquetting press before you'd driven off the moisture and you'd, and you'd, you'd generate enough heat for the reaction to take place. So we scrapped it. We, we went with uh, concentrate feed into the TBRCs, which in, in turn, of course, led to more dust carryover, hood accretions, and, and build up in the flu system. So that was the first uh, thing that uh, we, we, we had to play with. And then uh, the first few heats, uh, the, the TBRCs produced a 45 ton uh, melt at about 1,640 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot. Uh, that's why you needed a rotary furnace. Um, and uh, 
the uh, the material uh, was uh, you you charged it, you melted in with an oxy natural gas flame, then you blew some of the sulfur out to bring the copper to sulfur ratio down to about three and a half to one, and then you had to back reduce with coke to remove nickel oxides and dissolved oxygen in the melt. Uh, that melt was then t t uh, poured into a uh, refractory line ladle and taken up and put into an induction furnace. Unfortunately, we didn't back reduce the first few melts very well. and We ended up with a couple of hundred tons of nickel oxide, <laughs> scrap the induction furnace. And very quickly, we had to uh, put in sliding gate valves on the bottom of the refractory line ladles. And we put a tilting tundish in and we granulated uh, from those. Uh, again, it was a very quick decision uh, to do that. Um, granulation, um, you pouring hot metal at 1600 odd degrees into a water stream, probably about half a ton a minute of, of, of metal. Uh, maybe I think, my serve, memory serves me correctly, about 3000 gallons a minute of water. And uh, the material that would then be granulated, fine shot, go into a dewatering bin. And uh, these were quite efficient, but the water carried just a very small amount of solids over with it. And after we'd been operating for a few months, somebody took a look at the cooling tower, which was wooden. <laughs> we were in in dire danger of collapsing the, the structure because we, we it made it that it, much it, heavier. Yes, I mean wow. the, the nickel, the nickel yeah. settled out in the cooling tower. So um, again, a very quick decision. Uh, we built, uh, we purchased a uh, lamella thickener clarifier because uh, it had a small footprint on the ground, uh, so we could fit it in reasonably well. And uh, again, as I say, a very quick decision to do that. And this was the first application of this technology at Inco, so I was quite pleased with that. Um, the other thing was that the gases coming out of the TBRCs, of course, they have to go. They had to go through an evaporative uh, cooling tower, uh, and then before they went through a hot gas preset. And uh, the uh, the evaporation chambers had a series of uh, sprays in the, in the roof and uh, these were uh, activated by the discharge temperature from the, from the tower. Um, supposed to be a dry bottom operation, but the sprays were A, they were too coarse and B, there were about 18 of them and they worked, worked in increments of about three gallons a minute. That result was we had a wet bottom operation and we had this highly acidic slurry which we then had to redirect to a, uh, a small thickener. We throw in sodium hydroxide balls and every now and again we dump the whole lot out on the floor <laughs> to recycle the material through the TBRC. So not a very pleasant operation as you can imagine. So uh, I contacted uh, a company called Sonic Development. They came in and we did some test work using Sonic nozzles and basically these are fairly sophisticated nozzles which, nozzles which uh, shattered the water into a much finer spray and the whole thing was modulated. You, you had water and the high pressure air which was modulated to, to create this and we went to a dry bottom operation so I was very pleased with that. So you know starting up the first few years uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of problems but we solved them quickly and uh, successfully. Yeah, a lot of things to uh, adjust on the go. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had mentioned a few times the uh, abatement program, but you had, um, I think you had worked, or can I at least talk about INCO's abatement program to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions? Yes. Uh, INCO, when I came here in 1968, INCO was putting out between 4,500 and 6,200 metric tons a day of sulfur dioxide. And just before we go further, could you explain uh, a bit what are the effects of sulfur dioxide and, and well, what first it is for, in layman's terms? Well, first of all, it's, it's not very pleasant. It's an acidic <laughs> gas. You can't breathe it, okay? Um, 
And the other thing is, if uh, if you if you have a, a, a plume with high levels of SO2 in it, and it contacts the ground, it burns the vegetation, and it also, of course, creates acid rain in the atmosphere. And we ended up during the Mulroney Regan years of having a, an acid uh, rain agreement with the United States to cut back the emissions because eventually, of course, the acid rain eats away buildings. So. Um, that was the that was the basis of it. Now in 1971, I guess 70, 71, we built the 1,250 foot stack, and uh, that uh, resulted in us being able to discharge the gas much higher because the old stacks. This was 380 meters. The old stacks were about 150 meters. So we had the single largest point source of, of uh, sulfur dioxide in the North American continent, obviously contributing significantly to the acid rain problem. By discharging higher, we managed to clean up the, 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 the ground level concentrations around Sudbury so that you didn't have to, uh, I, I mean, I actually on occasion I had to wear a gas mask even in my office, <laughs> try answering the telephone <laughs> with a gas mask. Not very pleasant. Um, so. That was, uh, that was the start. Now, with the stack, that was one thing, but also they then started to, to remove pyrotite, which is an iron sulfide, from the, from the concentrate in the milling process. And by 73 to 78, we were down to, from about uh, 5,400, shall we say, down to 3,000 tons a day of SO2. And that continued then down to about uh, 1,900 tons a day by about 1984. And during that time, the mills had, had done their part of the job by, by removing the pyrotite. Um, at the same time, a lot of research and development work was done at our research facilities in Toronto, Port Colborne Research Stations, uh, Thompson and Coppercliff Smelters, to come up with a, uh, a new smelting operation that would allow us to fix more of the sulfur dioxide, either as acid or as liquid SO2. And eventually uh, the decision was made to go with uh, a bulk concentrate smelter. So we built a couple of flash furnaces, we put in a big acid plant, we completely changed the, the copper smelter uh, in, 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 in Coppercliff. Uh, putting in a new uh, new processes which use top blowing and bottom stirring and so on. So uh, a lot of innovation went into it and uh, I forget what the cost was but it was it was probably close to a billion dollars or so in the in, the, in that time uh, to do that and we got the first uh, furnace started up on nickel concentrate in 1993 and we went over to bulk in 1994. As a result of that, we brought down the SO2 emissions to somewhere in the 700 to 750 ton a day range. Which was compared to initially? Initially, let's say an average of about 5,400. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so a significant reduction. Uh, in 2006, a few years after I retired, they, they started to fix the FBR gases in map processing, and uh, that brought the, the, the discharge down by about another 180 tons a day. And now the final piece of the puzzle is to fix the converter gases. And uh, uh, once that's done, we should, they should be down, I say we, they should be down somewhere less than 40 tons a day of, of sulfur dioxide emission to the atmosphere. So, if, you know, significant improvement. Yeah, no kidding. And it's had an amazing effect, of course, in the Sudbury region. I mean, the, when we built the, 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 the new smelter, if you like, was, was retrofitted into the existing one whilst we were still operating the old system. There was no, there was no cutback in operation. Uh, a lot of admiration for the engineers who, who <laughs> managed to sort of fit it all together and do that. Um, but uh, workroom environment, significant improvement in the workroom environment. Uh, a lot better lighting, uh, a lot cleaner, a lot less gas, a lot less dust. Um, and uh, the external environment, uh, well, the company also not only worked with uh, uh, government and, and uh, the universities and so on, they, they, they did all this to, to uh, uh, put vegetation back on a lot of very barren rock. and. Uh, 
They also uh, grew pine seedlings underground in the Creighton mine, and uh, to uh, they would spend a year sort of like hydroponics. And uh, yeah, I heard about that. And then they bring the the, the, the plants up uh, to the surface to 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 uh, acclimatize for a year, and then they plant them out. I forget how many millions of trees now, but I think it's somewhere in the six, seven, eight million trees have been planted around the Sudbury region uh, since the seventies. Oh. And uh, so, a, a real regreening. Yeah, no kidding. And now it's. Um I think it's rated one of the most beautiful cities in Canada or something like that. Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, we, we, we have uh, several hundred lakes mm -hmm. around the area um, and with the trees and uh, so on. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's not a bad place to, to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I first came here, I always referred to it as a one-horse hick mining town. It's very much a, <laughs> a, 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 a very nice uh, town now. It's, it's, uh, it's got everything you need here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it used to, uh, back in the day, didn't it, the um, NASA came here to... Uh, yes, they trained the astronauts. Simulate Mars, right? Uh, well, the moon. Or the moon, sorry, Mars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> moon, that's what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> well, the Sudbury Basin was created, we believe, by meteorite impact. And so there are things called shatter cones. Uh, and uh, they, they came up here to uh, be trained, if you like, on what the geology of the moon was going to look like. Um, I'm not a geologist, but uh, that's basically, I think, why they came here. Okay. It didn't have to do with uh, a lot of the the barren or, or dead land well, that was created by the emissions? Or? Uh, the countryside was pretty barren around okay. the, the smelter uh, and so on, uh, and that's where they, were, that's where they went. Just around the back of the, the smelter, and the acid rain or the, the the sulfur dioxide and so on over the over the course of time, uh, coupled with the fact that when they first started smelting in the Sudbury region, they cut down trees. They cut the trees down, put a layer of logs, put a layer of ore, a layer of logs, and so on, and they had the then they'd set fire to it, okay, uh, to drive off the sulfur dioxide. Uh, or the sulfur as sulfur dioxide, so of course this had a <laughs> a very negative impact. Okay. Yeah, looked like a volcano and <laughs> <laughs> very barren. Uh, I would say now, probably in a few years, they'll probably have to strip some of the vegetation off the rock just to show what the old rock looked like. I mean, it's it's you know they've they've done a very good mm -hmm. job. Yeah. Do you um, more of a, a social question here? But do you believe there's a disconnect between uh, this industry and the general public in Canada? Well, the public uh, probably had a, um, a very poor opinion of heavy industry purely and simply because of the, the, the pollution. Uh, I mean, my wife is a, a local girl and, and she, uh, she would say, you know, you, you used to go downtown Sudbury to go shopping and the, you know, you, you'd see the, the, the air turning blue as the gas came through. Well, that doesn't, doesn't really uh, uh, sit well with the general public. Um, I think, uh, you know, the resource industries uh, by and large uh, have, uh, have really cleaned up their act. Um, part of it from pressure, obviously, from government. But, um, I mean, you know, in, in 2014, I think the numbers were that uh, the resource industries were accounted for 20% of GDP, employed 1.8 million people. Um, and uh, I don't think it really helped when our Prime Minister turned around and said it wasn't the resources beneath our feet, but the resourcefulness between our ears that was going to be important in the future. Um, I think that was a smart aleck re remark, but if he'd said both together, then that would have been a smart thing to say. Um, you know, politicians are always full of, we need world-class Canadian industries, we need research and development dollars spent to create new processes, uh, new uh, materials, new products. We need to va add value to the products we sell. Well, I worked for a company like that for 30 years. Um, they were leaders in 
not just developing but also adopting or adapting technology uh, in minerals re in minerals exploration, mining. You're going to be talking to Greg Vaden later today. Uh, Greg was uh, very involved in the developing of remote mining techniques. So you you know, the prime minister could sit in his office in a in a chair and he could control a a drill or a, a scoop tram underground to create and mine. Um, the company over the, the years uh, leader in in the in the use of tonnage oxygen for smelting with the Inco flash furnace, uh, top blowing bottom stirred vessels. Uh, fluid bed roasting, uh, and so on. So a lot of these things. And then, of course, pressure carbonylation for refining and the production of pure pellets and pure powders. And, and some of these specialist powders, I mean, you know, they, 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 they come out of a, a premium. And what's happened to that company? <laughs> what's happened yeah. to all that R&D effort? Uh, no it's, it, it's no longer uh, Canadian. Uh, it remains to be seen whether Valet taking over Inco was a good move or not for Sudbury, for the province, for Canada. Um, the jury's still out. Mm -hmm. Okay. What uh, what is your opinion on on that phenomenon? Because it is, I guess, a phenomenon. A lot of Canadian companies in this industry, specifically, who are disappearing or are still there, but under uh, non-Canadian names. Well, I <laughs> I don't want to sound like a socialist, but uh, if you have foreign government owned or controlled or financed companies coming in with deep pockets and taking over uh, Canadian industries, um, I don't think unless there's reciprocity, can we go back in there and take over them? The answer is no. So until there's reciprocity, I don't think they should be encouraged nor allowed to, to take over. Um, the, uh, you know, how many Canadian oil companies have taken over a Chinese oil company? I'm not aware of any. And yet now we have a government that's saying, well, maybe we need to sit down and, and, and have a free trade pact with the Chinese. Be very careful. That's all I'm going to say. Be very, very careful because you can end up gutting all the head office jobs, all the infrastructure of these industries, and the profits go overseas. Next question is... Um a mouthful <laughs> and an earful, <clears throat> and that's a this question in your opinion. So in your opinion, are there any events, people, inventions, contributions, disasters, anything whatsoever? I think we just answered that one. Actually. Yeah, is that because I was going to say, um, yeah. yeah, that must be discussed when uh, when talking about the natural resource history in Canada. And, and I was going to say, the, the topic we just talked about, the disappearance of a lot of Canadian companies, is actually a recurring um, subject in this in this question. Well, I think again, going back to what I said just now, um, if you are taken over by another large mining company, that, uh, for example, uh, if we've been taken over by Rio Tinto or somebody like that, well, you know, there, there's an opportunity for reciprocity there. But when you're taken over by a government-owned or financed company, uh, you're you're you know you're really giving away the baby with the bathwater. So uh, I, I I feel quite strongly about that, and it was a quite a traumatic event I think for the Sudbury region. And again, uh, you know the politicians make an awful lot of noise about some of this stuff, but when push came to shove, when Inco tried to merge with Falconbridge. No help at all. Okay, uh, we had a one-year strike here in Sudbury, and our local MPP, you, he wouldn't, he didn't make any sound at all. I knew he had a conflict of interest, but he could have declared his conflict of interest. When you have a foreign company that won't even negotiate for the best part of twelve months. There's something wrong with our systems that 
cannot bring the two sides to a table. And I made the point to several politicians that every mining company and smelting company, you have to have operating licenses to do these things. Well, maybe the, 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 the pressure point with these foreign companies is to turn around and say, listen, uh, we will remove your operating license or we'll suspend it for a period of time until you sit down and talk. Anyway, that's as far as I'm prepared to go <laughs> with that. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll change the subject a bit. Um, question regarding uh, women, the presence or absence of women. Uh, has that changed? When, oh, what has it been like? Significantly. In 68, there might have been uh, one or two uh, secretaries, female secretaries out in the plants, but for the most part, the female population, such as it was, would be an analyst in the lab and secretarial staff in the, in the, in the general office. Uh, in the 70s, in the nickel refinery, I know we started to hire one or two uh, female uh, for the unit, not just technicians or air engineers. Um, and that's progressed um, over the years and by the time I retired, I mean the last few years we, we were hiring uh, or we were taking on an engineering training program for young engineers and I used to hire probably as many women as I, as I hired, uh, women engineers as I would hire men. Um, so I would say by the, by the, the late 1990s uh, a lot of women not only in the unit but uh, women had moved up into section leader and superintendent's positions, not just in, just in process tech, but also in, in operations. So, a complete, complete change. Now, is it 50-50 is it equality? Um, I don't think so, but um, the efforts were made. And, and, and uh, certainly at INCO, uh, just because you were, uh, you know, if you were an engineer and you had a certain, you know, position, it didn't matter whether it was male or female, you got paid that rate for the job kind of deal. Um, so now whether there's a glass ceiling in there somewhere, I don't know. I think they might have a bit more problem perhaps with valet and the uh, Brazilian uh, style of management. Sure. But again, I, I, can't, I can't comment, I can't, I can't guess. I mean, I... In the uh, early days when more women, you started integrating more women, um, were any of them met with any animosity, or or was it a fairly good? Uh, I don't integration? think so. I, I I I didn't I didn't see any any real animosity. Um, now, if you it, it, there are there were certain uh, what should I say prohibitions perhaps of of having women work underground in the mining sector, um, but I've never worked in the mines, so I'm I'm not sure. But I I know that. Uh, it was considered a bad luck yes. <laughs> to, to employ women underground. Um, there are women working underground now, mm -hmm. and I don't think we've had any disasters. So, yeah. no, that's right. I just talked about that in uh, my last interview this morning. Yeah, about uh, <laughs> um, it was with uh, Gord Slade yeah. from Falcon Bridge, and how he he was one of the first to uh, to bring at least women because back in his day. Women only worked there, but they weren't allowed to ever even go down to visit or take a look. So he was one of the first to invite the ladies to go down, and then the families and things yeah. like that on weekends. So yeah. <laughs> take well, that stigma away. When the Queen first came here, you know, I mean, that was that was uh, that was almost a revolution to to put her into a boiler suit and let her go underground. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Throughout your career, have you had a, um, a or a few uh, mentors? Is there someone that stands out? In my career, no. Um, in life? There, are, there, are, there, are, there are one or two people. I mean, I, let's be honest. I, I work for a, a lot of very good men uh, who were far more knowledgeable than I, and I learned a lot from them. Um, but in terms of... Uh, the one mentor would have been uh, a fellow who lived next door to me uh, back home uh, in England. Uh, I wasn't doing very well at ordinary level physics. He was a young guy next door. He was a, uh, a, an engineer with Decker radar. He had left school, 
been called up to his national service, didn't know what the heck he was going to do, so he trained as a radar technician, found his, his, his calling. calling, went to university after he finished his national service. And so anyway, he sat down with me, and over the course of three months, he worked through the complete ordinary level physics syllabus, and I passed the exam with flying colors. So, if you like, he was probably a, a very good mentor. But the guy that probably had the most influence on my life was my father. Um, it's not that we always saw eye to eye, far from it. Uh, but um, a living with a regimental sergeant major is not easy. Um, so I was a very shy, introvert fellow. And when I hit 13, uh, the commanding officer of the school cadet corps, army cadet corps, sent home a form. Because it was voluntary then, prior to that it had been compulsory, it was now voluntary, had to have parental permission so they could get you into the army cadets if you wished to join. Well, my father, there was no discussion, my father volunteered me. And uh, <laughs> it was a turning point because I was forced to become far more extrovert uh, if you want to teach a squad of cadets, uh, stand up in front of a group of people, um, and so on, uh, you have to become more extrovert. I went on to become a senior school prefect. I not only was a member of the school cadet corps, I went on the adult staff and taught at an outside cadet corps as an adult sergeant when I was 18. And that scholarship that I got with Richard Thomas Baldwin's in large part was due to the fact that because of all the work I'd done with cadets, plus obviously academic ability, um, when I was interviewed, the interviewer was uh, an ex-Indian Army colonel. So all that cadet work Paid stood off. me in very good stead. Paid off. Um, I think they put out 16 scholarships that year out of uh, 5,000 plus applicants. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a, a very good move. And at university, I went through the officers' training corps. I was commissioned into the Territorial Army as a second lieutenant in 1966, and uh, so on. So it, it, it was something which allowed me to, or forced me to become more extrovert uh, and to develop whatever leadership potential I may or may not have had. So, uh, you know, I, I seem to find that just about any organization I, I, I join, whether it be, you know, sort of Kiwanis Club or, <laughs> or the Opera Guild, uh, I always seem to end up, uh, you know, as the president. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, yes, it was, it, was a, it was a turning point in my life. And uh, for that, I thank him. He knew more about me than I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what parents are for sometimes. <laughs> Even if it's, it doesn't seem uh, fair or right <laughs> when it happens. Um, just two, a few um, closing questions. One would be, uh, what would be the proudest, what are you proudest of in your professional career? In my professional career, I would say uh, the contribution I made to the team that started up the nickel refinery converter plant, and again, the, the effort that we put in to get the bulk smelter up and running. I would say those, those are the two things that really stand out and that I'm proudest of. And of course then the side effect of all that has been the improvement in the, in the environment around mm -hmm. the Sudbury area. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can see that when you drive around in the summertime. Um, quite significant. Which I'll have to do one day. Yes. And the last question, <coughs> If you were to speak to someone much younger, like a younger self or a student um, <laughs> or a cadet, what uh, would be the most important life lesson or piece of advice you would give them? Oh, well. Regarding their, their future, whether it be professional or. I, I think there are just a few uh, rules. Uh, one, try and live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You upset far fewer people that way. Secondly, balance your career with your home and social responsibilities. Your job's important, 
because it puts food on the table and a roof over your head, but and hopefully it will also lead to you know self fulfillment and so on. Uh, the higher needs that that we have as human beings. Your home is important. Uh, it's a refuge. It's a place to go when you need support, rest, relaxation. Because not every day is a sunny day. And as far as the social responsibility is concerned, put something back into the community. Join a service club. Teach or coach young people in a sport or cadets or the scouts or something along those lines. Volunteer to raise money for a charity or whatever. But do something, get it back. Because uh, you're going to be retired probably these days, you're going to be retired for 20 or 30 years. If you've got some of these hobbies and interests and so on, they carry over. Um, and you, you, you find yourself uh, very busy. And finally, remember you're never indispensable. Uh, so it's always a good idea to try and bring your subordinates along, let them reach their potential. And if they wish to move, don't hold them back. Because once you retire and they call you back, you may be working for them. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, on the other hand, there's always some people you'll meet or you'll have in your employer that that you can't help. You know, there's that saying, "You can't fix stupid." Well, you know, you always come across some of those. As my wife, who was a who was a nurse, says, you know, you you can't fix stupid, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> Give them a sedative. <laughs> <laughs> so, those are the, those would be the three things. Live by the golden rule. Balance your your life, and uh, remember you're not indispensable. Well, thank you. Is yeah. there anything else you'd like to add? No, just to say thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Well, thanks for the time. Mm -hmm.